Hey everyone, it's Sarah Threadster Nurse RN.com, and in this video, we're going to continue our series on shock by talking about neurogenic shock. And as always, after you watch this YouTube video, you can access the free quiz that will test you on this condition. So let's get started. Neurogenic shock occurs when the sympathetic nervous system loses the ability to stimulate nerve impulses. Now, when this happens, it's going to lead to major hemodynamic changes in our patients. Now, why is that? Well, one of the reasons is due to the massive vasodilation that is occurring. So what's happening is that our vessels are going to be relaxed. They're going to be wide. And in the end, what this leads to is decreased tissue perfusion. So the amount of oxygen that can go to those cells that make up our tissues and organs is very limited, which is why we're going to see signs and symptoms of shock. Now, neurogenic shock is occurring due to a nervous system issue, hence why we call it neurogenic. And it's occurring due to an issue with a division of the autonomic nervous system, which is the sympathetic nervous system. So we're having issues with that. Now you can also hear neurogenic shock sometimes being referred to as vasogenic shock. They're the same thing. Now neurogenic shock is a form of distributive shock. And in this series, we talked about two other types of shock that are also considered a distributive form of shock. And do you remember what they were. They were anaphylactic and septic. So in these three types of shock, we have this major vasodilation occurring. It's occurring for different reasons. Like with anaphylactic, it's due to an allergen. With septic, it was some type of infection. And with neurogenic, it's a nervous system issue, specifically our sympathetic nervous system. What's happening is that this sympathetic nervous system has lost the ability to regulate the diameter of our vessels. So they're just relaxed. And that is leading to the vasodilation. So distributive forms of shock affect how those small vessels work. And it's for different reasons depending on the type of shock. So what can cause neurogenic shock? And which patients are at risk for it? Well, any patient that has had a spinal cord injury, and we're talking about at certain locations. So if they've had like a cervical spine injury or an upper thoracic injury above T6, they're at risk for neurogenic shock. In addition, patients who have received spinal anesthesia or they're taking drugs that affect the autonomic or sympathetic nervous system that can lead to neurogenic shock. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology of neurogenic shock and simplify what is occurring in this condition. Okay, so we've established that this is occurring because we have an issue with our sympathetic nervous system. It's lost the ability to stimulate nerve impulses. And this is a big problem because we're gonna to have major hemodynamic changes because the sympathetic nervous system plays a huge role with our blood pressure especially and how it regulates the diameter of those vessels. So let's do a quick review. Okay, the sympathetic nervous system arises out of the autonomic nervous system. So what does that autonomic nervous system do? It controls those functions that we can't consciously control, like our heart rate, our blood pressure, digestion, just to name a few. And you can take the autonomic nervous system and divide it into two systems. You have the parasympathetic system, which is that rest and digest system. It allows you to just chill. It decreases your heart rate. It allows you to digest food. Now, the sympathetic nervous system is that system that keeps you alive, especially when you're in danger. And it does a lot of functions, like it dilates your pupils for better vision so you can see the danger. It increases your heart rate and it increases blood pressure. Now, one way it does that by like increasing your blood pressure is that the sympathetic nervous system plays a role in controlling vasomotor tone. So what does that fancy word mean? Well, what the sympathetic nervous system does is it regulates the diameter of our vessels. And how it does this is that these sympathetic nerve fibers that are coming out of that sympathetic nervous system branch out and hang out 
on the layer of the vessels. And these neurotransmitters are going to be released called epinephrine and norepinephrine. And remember what those do? Those are big like vasopressor type agents. They're going to cause vasoconstriction. And they will do that at a rate whenever they're needed by the sympathetic nervous system when it's stimulated. So if you have a high rate of those firing, you're going to be having vasoconstriction. But if you have a low rate or if it's not being fired at all, what's that vessel going to do? It's just going to relax. It's going to dilate. And that is what is happening here in this condition. So with this major vasodilation, this is going to affect the resistance in our vessels. If our vessel is nice and open and relaxed, that's going to decrease the resistance inside of it. So we're going to have a decrease in our systemic vascular resistance which is gonna cause us a lot of problems and affect our cardiac output. So let me try to illustrate it this way so maybe it'll stick in your head a little bit better. If we take a water hose, and let's say the water hose is our vessel, and we narrow that water hose, we've just increased the resistance that that water must flow against. And that's gonna really increase the pressure of how that water is flowing throughout there. If you narrow that water hose and on the other end, you're just gonna see that water shooting out at a very high speed and it has a lot of pressure on it. But if we take that water hose and we widen it, that water doesn't have a lot of resistance it has to go through, does it? That water, if it's so wide, could actually just pull in that vessel and maybe not even flow forward if it's so wide. And that's really the same thing that's happening here. These vessels have widened up so much because they've lost resistance that it's going to decrease the blood pressure. So you're going to see hypotension and you're going to see where there can be venous pooling of blood in this peripheral area in these extremities. So back to the systemic vascular resistance, because we've lowered that resistance so much, that's going to decrease cardiac afterload. And afterload is the amount of resistance that that ventricle must overcome to pop open that aortic valve to get that blood out of the heart. Well, if it's not meeting a lot of resistance because we have this massive vasodilation, it's going to be easier for that ventricle to squeeze that blood out of itself and open up the aortic valve. So we've dropped cardiac afterload. Now, with our venous pooling, because there's not much resistance, getting that blood back to the heart, that's going to cause some other issues. First, it's going to decrease the amount of blood that's going to return to this heart. That's going to cause a problem because it's not going to leave the heart a lot of blood to pump. And the heart maintains our cardiac output, which is the amount of blood that the heart pumps per minute. If we're not pumping a lot of blood per minute, there's not a lot of blood that's rich in oxygen going to those cells that make up our tissues and organs. So the blood here is just going to be pulling, hanging out. Now this is going to decrease cardiac preload. So because you have a decrease of venous blood return, Preload is where those ventricles, is the amount that those ventricles stretch once they have filled at the end of diastole. If you don't have a lot of blood flowing back to them, they're not really filling very much. So preload and afterload play a role with cardiac output. It plays a role with the stroke volume. So cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. If we're decreasing those things, we're decreasing cardiac output. Another big thing I want you to remember about this venous pooling of blood in these extremities is that whenever that happens, if we have blood just hanging out, what does that increase the chance of? We want blood constantly going throughout the body. It can increase the chance of a deep vein thrombosis forming. So when we talk about nursing interventions, keep that in mind. Another thing that is going to play a role with this whole hypothermia thing that we're going to experience a little bit later on is that whenever blood is pulling here in the extremities and the peripheral area, it's not returning back to the body. So here's all the blood hanging out. And whenever it's hanging out here, it's going to be causing the body to lose a lot of heat. So heat is going to be leaving the body and you can feel on the extremities that they will be warm and dry, but the 
body itself will be cold because you have this venous point and it's even going to play a big role with the body cooling off more because it's just hanging out there. Another thing that's going to affect our cardiac output is our heart rate because remember cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. So these patients can experience bradycardia, where your heart rate is less than 60. Now why are they experiencing a slow heart rate? Well, remember we talked about the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. Parasympathetic system keeps your heart rate nice and slow, helps you rest. The sympathetic nervous system is going to increase the heart rate. Well, if we don't have the sympathetic nervous system being able to work the way it should, who's going to take over and just keep doing what it does, the parasympathetic system. And it's going to be unopposed by the sympathetic nervous system that normally keeps your heart rate up. So it will take over and we can see bradycardia. And lastly, another big thing that's going to be occurring is hypothermia. And this is from where our hypothalamus is really not working very well. It can't regulate our temperature. So we will have a low temperature rate. And the big thing I want you to take away with this because it's different than the other types of shock is that because you had the vasoconstriction, those extremities felt cold and clammy in the other ones, right? Well, because we have this venous pooling of blood here, and it's not really, it's not returning to the heart. The extremities can be warm and dry, but the body will be cold and the overall core body temperature can be low, hypothermic. So keeping all that pathophysiology in mind, let's sum up our signs and symptoms that we're gonna see in this patient. Now remember when we talked about the other types of shock, in those early stages, that sympathetic nervous system really could take over to try to save our life at first, right? By causing vasoconstriction, by regulating the diameter of those vessels, by secreting epinephrine and norepinephrine, and it can do that and help us out a little bit. But here in this type of shock, remember that sympathetic nervous system just can't do that. So that's why some of these signs and symptoms are a little bit different compared to those other types of shock. So you wanna remember those differences. So of course we're gonna have the hypotension, the low blood pressure, and that's because you have the massive vasodilation going on and you have the decreased systemic vascular resistance. The bradycardia was from where we have an unopposed parasympathetic nervous system. It's really the one taking over because the sympathetic nervous system isn't there to increase the heart rate. So you can have that. The hypothermia where we're having, where we can't regulate our temperature, our body is cooling off because it's just pulled in our peripheral area and it's just cooling and it's not returning back to the body. So they can have warm, dry extremities, but the body itself is cold and that core body temperature can become hypothermic. And another thing that can be seen is if your patient has hemodynamic monitoring through like a pulmonary artery catheter, they would have low filling pressures in the heart, like a low pulmonary artery wedge pressure. And that is occurring because we have that massive vasodilation. So again, was blood returning to the heart very well? No, you have decreased systemic vascular resistance. There's no resistance really pushing it there. So you're decreasing your preload and really the filling pressures in the heart. So that would be low. Now, one thing I just wanted to hit on quickly was that neurogenic shock and spinal shock are two different conditions. Spinal shock, you're gonna have um, signs and symptoms associated with sensation, with motor, and with reflexes. In neurogenic shock, you're really just seeing these hemodynamic changes in your patient. Now let's wrap up this lecture and let's talk about nursing interventions and treatments for a patient in neurogenic shock. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about the goal. What's our goal for this patient? Well, it's to manage the patient's ABCs and we're talking about airway, breathing, circulation, and spine. So a big thing what we wanna do is we want to protect the patient's spine. They most likely have had some type of injury. That's the big cause of neurogenic shock. And again, it was the cervical area or the upper thoracic above T6. And we wanna keep the spine immobilized. We don't want to cause any more damage and decrease perfusion to the spine. So some ways that we can do this is have the patient wearing a cervical collar and um, log rolling the patient during transport or using a backboard. That can really help uh, keep the spine immobilized.
Another important thing that we're gonna be doing, of course, is assessing and managing the airway. And the airway can be affected with these patients depending on the location of the injury. So they may need intubation and mechanical ventilation if respiratory failure is present. And of course, because our patient is in shock, we want to maintain tissue perfusion. This is where we're maintaining circulation. So patients who have had like spinal injuries, we wanna make sure that that spine is being perfused along with the other organs. So a goal is to maintain the MAP, the mean arterial pressure, to be between 85 to 90 millimeters of mercury. This will help maintain perfusion to the organs, especially the spine. Now, how are we gonna do this? One way is through the administration of IV fluids. This can be crystalloids. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna fill those dilated vessels, increase the venous return to the heart, which will increase cardiac preload and help play a role in increasing our stroke volume, which will help increase our cardiac output. However, whenever giving patients with neurogenic shock IV fluids, we have to use this with caution because we don't have an issue with uh, fluid loss. They normally have a normal fluid volume. So we wanna make sure we're not sending them into fluid volume overload. And if your patient started having difficulty breathing, you are hearing crackles when you listen to their lung sounds, they're uh, getting swollen with edema, or if they have hemodynamic monitoring and you can see that they have a high central venous pressure, CVP, or a high pulmonary artery wedge pressure, which again represents the filling pressures in the heart, you want to suspect that this patient is probably in fluid volume overload. Now, how about if the fluids are not working to maintain tissue perfusion? Well, vasopressors can be used. And what these drugs will do is they will cause vasoconstriction. And we need some vasoconstriction in these patients because we have major vasodilation. Our sympathetic nervous system is not controlling our vasomotor tone and our vessels are just really relaxed. So we need to throw on something that will help them contract, constrict. So whenever we do this, this is going to increase systemic vascular resistance where we were once decrease. And when we increase systemic vascular resistance, that's gonna increase blood pressure. And in the long run, we can increase cardiac output. And another type of drug that can be used that's also a vasopressor but has positive inotropic effects is dopamine. Dopamine will vasoconstrict and increase the heart rate. So when you throw all that together, we're gonna to increase our tissue perfusion. Now, what about bradycardia? If your patient has a really low heart rate, what can be done? Well, atropine can be given, and this drug will increase the heart rate. And how it does this is it blocks the parasympathetic effects on the heart. And remember, the parasympathetic system was being unopposed, so it's just keeping the heart nice and slow. So this medication will help combat that. But if the bradycardia is really severe, the patient may need temporary pacing. And some more nursing interventions for this patient would be around the hypothermia that the patient can be experiencing. So of course we wanna be monitoring their body temperature very closely and be using warming devices as ordered by the physician to help keep the patient warm. And we don't want to rewarm them too fast. You wanna do it at a moderate rate. And consider Foley placement because some patients lose their bladder function and we don't want them to retain urine, so we wanna drain that out. Plus, we need to keep track of their urinary output and make sure it's at least 30 cc's per hour. Because in shock, remember, the kidneys can be affected if they're not being perfused very well. If we have a low urinary output, that tells us our kidneys are really struggling and we're possibly in renal failure territory. And we want to prevent deep vein thrombosis, a DVT, because remember, these patients are at risk for this because of that massive vasodilation, allowing that blood to pool. So we wanna make sure that we're putting in our plan of care, that we're gonna perform range of motion exercises daily with these patients, applying compression stockings, administering anticoagulants per the MD order. And we wanna make sure that 
We avoid allowing the patient to cross their legs, which can impede blood flow, or placing a pillow under the knees because this will compromise circulation. Okay, so that wraps up this review over neurogenic shock. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take the free quiz and to subscribe to our channel for more videos.